I am presenting Union Gospel Press's Sunday School Lesson Number 4, Sunday, March 28th, 2021. The lesson is entitled Righteousness Through Faith. Lesson text comes from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. Related scriptures are Ephesians 1, 7 through 14, and 2, 8 through 9, Hebrews 9, 1 through 15. The place is from Corinth. The time is 56 AD. This week's lesson text picks up where last week ended. Paul concluded that both Jews and Gentiles were guilty as sinners. This week, he begins the discussion of God's solution to humanity's sin problem. Because we are all sinners under God's just wrath, God offers the same gracious salvation to us all. God designed and implemented the solution to humanity's sin problem. Since he is holy, God's solution could not overlook our sin. Because he is loving and merciful, God chose not to utterly destroy sinful humanity. Instead, he decided to extend his own righteousness to sinful man on the basis of faith in Christ. Today's aim, facts. To study Paul's teaching about the righteousness of God. Principle, to understand that right standing with God is available only through faith in Christ. Application, to share our faith with others that we are made righteous only through Christ. Illustrating the lesson, the righteousness of God extends to all who place their faith in Christ. Practical points. One. The law still reflects God's standard of righteousness, Romans 3.21. 2. All mankind has sinned. Only Jesus, who is sinless, can save us, verses 22 through 26. 3. There is no room for boasting within the body of Christ, verse 27. 4. Our good deeds cannot earn our salvation. It is a gift from God, verse 28. 5. God's righteousness is available for all people of the world. Verse 29. 6. Many people claim to keep the law, but God, but God requires the righteousness of Christ. Verses 30 through 31. Golden text. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Romans 3.21. Today we have three lesson outlines. The first is alienated by sin, coming from Romans 3, 21 through 23. The second is accepted by grace, Romans 3, 24 through 26. And the third is assured by faith, Romans 3, 27 through 31. Introduction. When Jesus entered the holy city on what was to be his final week, he was fully aware of what was going to transpire. Luke 9.51 says, When the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He was the Lamb of God, John 1.29, about to die for the sins of humanity. This was foreordained before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1.24, Revelation 13.8. For the most part, the four evangelists do not interpret the events of Christ's life, at least in great detail. They record what happened, but say relatively little about why it happened. Romans and other epistles help us understand the ongoing relevance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. When Jesus died, it was not a tragedy. It was the fulfillment of God's plan to free sinners from the curse of sin. Continuing in Romans 3, we will see Paul expound on the changes that take place in us at the moment of salvation. Alienated by sin, Romans 3.21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God's righteousness, Romans 3, 21 through 22. 
The righteousness of God can refer to God's character and his just actions, or it can have in mind our relationship with him, that is, our right standing before the Lord. The purpose of the law is to convict people of their sins so they will repent and turn to the Lord in faith, Romans 20. We are saved by placing our faith in Christ, and our approach to God is by grace. For in Christ we are not under the law, but under grace, 614. That we approach God apart from the law does not mean we disregard his commandments or live as we please. As Paul himself asked, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verses 1 through 2. But this approach to God through faith in Christ is not really new. There is ample testimony in the law and the prophets, 321, which testify that God has always justified people by faith, beginning with Abraham, Romans 4, 2. The Old Testament scriptures also prophesize the Messiah's coming, establishing new and living way, Hebrews 10:20. As already seen in Lesson 2, Paul made it clear that the Gentile world was estranged from God because of their idolatry and perversion. For their part, the Jews had many advantages because of their privileged position in God's plan, but that did not leave them guiltless. Whether Jew or Gentile, the gospel alone has the power to save, Romans 1.6. Consequently, right standing with God is on the basis of faith and granted to all them that believe. 322. Although most English speakers use the words believe and faith somewhat differently, the New Testament words believe and faith come from the same Greek root. Both mean to place confidence in, to trust. As seen elsewhere in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, James 2, 14 through 26, genuine faith is active, not merely a mental asset to certain facts about God, although those facts are true and objectively important. Man, sin, Romans 3, 22. Whatever differences exist among humans, there is one thing certain about all of us. We are sinners. This is the starting point for everyone in their journey to deliverance. While some will admit they are sinners, some of those same people are unwilling to acknowledge that their sins are serious enough to condemn them, John 3, 18. They think hell is, is reserved for only the, the vilest of criminals, not for the garden variety sinners they consider themselves to be. It is also common for people to put sins into graded categories, thinking that some sins are far worse than others. To be sure, the earthly consequences of sin may vary. Humanly speaking, it would be far worse to murder someone than to merely hate them. But scripture warns us, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer have eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3.15 All sins are serious because all sins condemn us. Since all of us have sinned, we are all in the same spiritual boat, so to speak. It is a sinking ship. We all desperately fall short of God's perfectly just and glorious expectations. Even what we consider our righteous deeds are like filthy rags compared to his holy standard, Isaiah 64, 6. The background to the word sin contains the idea of wandering from the right path or missing the mark. We might picture an archer shooting at a target and missing altogether. God is holy, we are unholy. He is perfect, we are imperfect. He is sinless, we are sinners. Hence, we have no hope of saving ourselves. If we are all sinners, we all need a savior. Concerning sin and salvation, people generally fall into four categories. Some are saved and know they are saved. Some may be saved and think they are lost. Some are lost and think they are saved. And some are lost and know they are lost. It is when we realize our total lostness that we can actually be saved. 
Many lost people think they are saved because they consider themselves to be good people, based, of course, on their own definition of goodness. That is why Jesus had a running conflict with the Pharisees. In their self-righteousness, they thought they deserved heaven on account of their good works and despised the failures of others. Luke 18, 9 through 14. Of these religious leaders, Christ said, How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. We cannot find true security in good works, but only in the fact that we have been given the righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith accepted by grace verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God verse 26 to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Redemption, Romans 3.24 Since sentences are made up of words, it is critical to understand the meaning of the words in order to understand the meaning of the sentence. Obviously, this is important in daily conversation, or we can easily misconstrue what someone has said. It is also true in reading the Bible. In this verse, there are three words that are virtually important in comprehending what Paul was saying. To be justified is to be declared not guilty. In spite of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, God has declared us not guilty. He could only do this on the basis of Jesus' perfect sacrifice. This he did freely. We neither earned it nor deserved it. Clearly, justification is based upon faith and is the source of our peace with God, 5.1. While we must exercise faith, we are actually enabled to believe in Christ by God's grace, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Fundamental to the gospel of salvation is the truth that the saving initiative from beginning to end belongs to God the Father. No formulation of the gospel is biblical that removes the initiative from God. It is as Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. John 6, 44. Our justification comes about by God's grace. As Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of our, yourselves, it is the gift of God. By definition, grace is unmerited favor. While unmerited, it is not unconditional. We must respond to God's grace by faith. Since salvation is not of works, verse 9, we contribute nothing to our deliverance from sin. This, however, does not mean we are purely passive recipients of God's grace. Faith is a must. Another important word in Romans 3.24 is redemption. Drawn from the ancient slave market, redemption had to do with paying the price for a slave to be set free. Though we were once slaves to sin, Christians can now enjoy the freedom to serve Christ out of love and gratitude. Such freedom does not grant permission for us to sin as we please, but rather encourages us to do as we should. Galatians 5, 1, 13. Remission. Romans 3, 25 through 26. Justification and redemption are found in Jesus Christ. Verse 24. And in no one else in no other way. God set forth his son for this purpose. Verse 25. Representing a single Greek word set, set forth could also be translated presented appointed, or even foreordained. Christ is the propitiation for our sins, 1 John 2, 1 through 2. This word is related to the Old Testament word for covering, and in the Greek Old Testament, septuagint. septuagint. It, it was used of the mercy seat, Leviticus 16, 2, Hebrews 9, 5. 
The mercy seat was the solid gold lid of the Ark of the Covenant where the high priest sprinkled blood on the Day of Atonement. Hence, a propitiation is, a, is an atoning sacrifice. In this case, Christ was the sacrifice. Propitiation especially means to turn away, wrath or appears or appease anger. It is God who is propitiated by the vindication of his holy and righteous character, whereby through the, the provision he has made in the vicarious and exploratory sacrifice of Christ, he has so dealt with sin that he can show mercy to the believing sinner in the removal of his guilt and the remission of his sins. The remission of sins that are past, Romans 3.25, refers to the sins that were committed under the Old Testament. As elaborate and detailed as the Levitical code was, this sacrificial system did not actually have the ability to remove sin. It only anticipated the pardon that would occur as a result of Christ's sacrifice, Hebrews 9.15. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second, 8, 7. The word remission means to pass over and appears only here in the New Testament. It may allude to God passing over Israel, but visiting judgment upon Egypt. The Lord said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, Exodus twelve thirteen. God did this to demonstrate his justice. Justice requires punishment for sin. That punishment was meted out at the cross, where God's Son was offered to pay the price of sin through his blood. God, therefore, was both just towards sinners and the justifier of sinners simultaneously. This should not be taken to mean that Christ's sacrifice automatically justifies all sinners, since his atonement actually applies only to those who trust in him as their Lord and Savior. One might think that Paul is committing himself to a doctrine of universal salvation, that all who have sinned are justified. That impression is certainly incorrect. God presents Jesus to all people as Savior, but he becomes this to those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.10 Assured by faith. Verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Verse 29, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Verse 30, Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Verse 31. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. One plan. Romans 3, 27 through 28. If salvation were something humans achieved through personal goodness, meritorious deeds, or the performance of religious rites, it could be viewed with pride. We could boast in the salvation we had earned, but thankfully it is not of works. Least any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 9. Such boasting is excluded because salvation is through faith, not by works. Paul does not mean that such works need not be performed, but that even when they are performed tolerably well, one is not thereby justified in God's sight. He is cutting the ground from under the feet of those who say, I always do the best I can. I try to live a decent life. I pay my lawful dues, and what more can God expect of me? Paul's conclusion, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, Romans 3.28. This statement would be particularly relevant to his fellow Jews, who tended to depend upon outward conformity to the law as the means of gauging their acceptance with God. Moreover, Paul was viewing this from an insider perspective as he no doubt felt the same way prior to his conversion. We see this in his reaction to his Jewish pedigree. Philippians 3, 4-7 
one God, Romans 3, 29 through 30. The God revealed in scripture is the God of all, Acts 10, 34 through 35. In spite of a privileged position, the Jews could not claim God as their exclusive deity. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him, 1012. Circumcision in 330 means Jews and uncircumcision means Gentile. While the outward rite of circumcision had special significance for the descendants of Abraham, Genesis 17, 10 through 11, it became insignificant under the new covenant, Romans 2, 28 through 29, Galatians 6, 15. Salvation is by faith in Christ, not by conformity to the law. There are not two means of being saved, one for Jews and another for Gentiles. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2.39 One way, Romans 3.31 In presenting these arguments, which are difficult at times to follow, Paul was not trying to eliminate the value of the law. He was actually upholding the law, for he saw that the true purpose of the law was to pave the way for the promised Messiah. Galatians 3.24 As Christ himself stated, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not coming to destroy but to fulfill. Matthew 5.17 The insistence of the apostle is that any works in performance of any such commandment are of no avail in justification. The question is then, does this abrogate the law of commandment and make it irrelevant and inoperative in every respect. Paul recoils with ab abhorrence from the suggestion and says, God forbid. We are to submit to God's law as a response of thankfulness. God provided salvation on his merit, and in response, we are called to worship in obedience. Questions. 1. What is meant by the righteousness of God? Romans 3.21 Two, how can a person experience the righteousness of God? Verse 22. Three, in what way are all people alike? Four, what does the word grace mean? Five, what is the image behind the word redemption? Six, what does the word propitiation mean? Seven, how can God be both just and and the justifier of sinners at the same time. Eight, why do saved people have no cause for boasting about it? Nine, is there a Jewish God and a Gentile God? Explain. Ten, in what way was Paul upholding the law? This concludes the Sunday School lesson for Sunday, March 28, 2021. Thank you for listening. God bless.